Yeah, trust people can hear and see us. Sorry, we're, we're just having some trouble locally. We're getting the laptop to connect to the conference room. Sorry about that. Um, my great pleasure now to introduce this seminar with Professor Jane Dallas, leader for the Archaeology Institute. She's going to tell us about her important uh, work on climate change. So I'm not to waste any more time now by making a long introduction, but just leave the chair to you, Jane. Thank you. Yes, many apologies about that. I'm going to have to go super fast now. <laughs> get to other things maybe. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk today about, um, as the title says, climate change and its impact on archaeology. Because um, climate change is a reality and as we all know is affecting many aspects of life. So in this talk I want to look at what some of those aspects of the impacts are on archaeology and how that in turn can help us to think about or act on the climate change. So it's that two-way thing between archaeology and heritage and climate change and our position within that. And these are themes that I'll be drawing out in some further modules and studies that um, you, may be, you may be doing those of you who are studying with us. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So this is just going through um how I'm going to be addressing this topic. So I'll be looking very briefly at the evidence for climate change, um, how we how we look at that from archaeological evidence, but I'd say briefly, the types of climate change and their impact. So I think it's hard to think about the types unless you can visualise them and you know more about um, what exactly climate change is doing to archaeology and heritage. Um, and the effects of climate change on two in two places, um, in Orkney and in Easter Island or Rapanui. So these are both very different, of course, in terms of where they are in the world, um, but some similarities in the issues they And then looking at um, the problems and perhaps some um, solutions or working towards solutions um, for these impacts. No. Oh, that's the end of that. You just zoomed out, I think you just need to zoom back in with a zoom bar in the corner. Is that funny? Okay, where we are. This is um, an illustration from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, showing the context of the periods that we're looking at. So this shows the long term um, climate change um, in terms of changes in surface temperature of the globe um, going back 10,000 years. So you can see some quite big oscillations and then um, in the historical decades you see um, more smaller changes and then the, the little ice age is, is featuring there in the um, 16th century thereabouts. And then the period um, which we're interested in terms of the, the causes at the moment or the impacts at the moment is an uh, industrial industrialization onwards where you can see the surface temperature ramping up and up until we get to around present day when it's just going up exponentially. Um, and just narrowing in on a bit more detail on that, you can see in the last 2000 years how um, we have the warm, the medieval warm period, um, the ice age, and then again, that modern warming um, discovered in the time that we've been able to record the information from in, in the more modern period. So that's just to put it in its context and say that the climate change that we're undergoing at the moment is human induced and that um, I'm sure as you all know the attempts at the moment to keep that within 1.5 or at 1.5 but that's looking extremely unlikely as you'll know from 
um, the last COP meeting, um, a lot of problems there at PP at 1.5 and the impacts therefore, um, some of which I'll just be discussing or touching on in what comes now. So that um, global warming, as it's called, is a, a combination of a number of impacts. So we're we'll looking at uh, sort of pulling those apart a bit and the, the particular types of heritage that um, I'll be looking at in most detail are what appear in this diagram, which is from Historic Environment Scotland's Guide to Climate Change Impacts, which is the, um, the buried remains and the surface remains. So there you can see two examples, well, buried remains of sites that are under the ground, obviously, surface remains monuments such as here, um, a, a stone circle which looks very like a stone stone to me. Um, so those are the those are the types of archaeological or her archaeological heritage that I'll be touching on. And this is a volume that you can access yourself quite freely to look at um, this breakdown because Historic Environment Scotland have done a lot of work on um, uh, the the impacts of climate change on heritage and, and leaders in that together with SCAPE, which is the Scottish Trust for Archaeology and the Problem with Erosion. So just going into that in a bit more detail, the, um, the precise types of hazards or weather effects which um, have been identified as having the most impacts on those surface and uh, monuments in Scotland um, have been found to be um, Temperature, that's the change in temperature. The rainfall, that's uh, generally increasing rainfall, but in some cases lessening the rainfall. Um, extreme weather and sea level rises combined with flooding. Now, of course, some of these things are things that are always been happening and varying to some degree, but then when you see them in different combinations and with combining um, compounding factors, um, it all gets. Um, to be uh, very disastrous for a number of things, including uh, archaeological heritage. So the text that goes alongside each of those types of um, impacts, um, temperature impacts from temperature change and extremes, for example, drought, not so much here, heat wave, um, and also different types of invasive pests and plants, rainfall, increased or reduced, extreme weather, and here um, in Orkney, particularly, that it comes in the terms of high winds and storms and increased storminess. So it's not the storms didn't happen before, it's that they happen more regularly um, and um, less predictably. Uh, sea level rises, um, as you know, they, they come from the melting of the ice and are in increasing at quite a rate and flooding. Um, which I'm sure you've all seen examples of some ongoing at the moment, parts of the world with great uh, tragic impacts. Added to which, uh, this slide, which um, Julie Gibson prepared, it brings together this. Is, all I'm saying in this slide is that added to that, waves are getting higher and there is increased storminess. So we've got these impacts, and then when you throw in a big storm with waves that are higher, combined with uh, sea levels that have gone up, even though the rise in the water levels might not be actually very much, it has huge um, negative impact. So this is this is bringing together the different strand of research as well, um, just to illustrate that these things all happen in combination um, with disastrous effects. Um, one example of this was seen. Um, in the uh, town of St. Margaret's Hope, which uh, is where one of the ferries in Orkney um, leaves and arrives at. Some of you might have been through this town for that purpose, um, or indeed live there. <laughs> so this is a, a really good example of um, the really big floods in St. Margaret's Hope, where um, there's a combination of low pressure, a storm surge, and then waves overtopping. Uh, St. Margaret's Hope, so that's a combination of the pressure with that storm surge and those unpredictable storms and then they will be surging more than they would have been um, and we'll get more incidences like this. 
in Orkney itself, as that previous caption said, um, the the impact of climate change are actually harder to predict. And that's not just because it's an island group and even the um, sea level change and sea level rise is hard to look at right across the whole island group because it varies slightly between islands. Um, but um, there's the un largely unknown impact too of the loss of the Gulf Stream or the, dis the disruption of the Gulf Stream and what impacts that will have. Because at the moment, that's what keeps our islands so beautifully warm. Um, I'm sure we've all noticed. <laughs> Uh, but it, yeah, so it could get a lot colder in winter. So in um, well pre pre COVID, um, a group of um, a group of various experts, uh, including myself, Historic Environment Scotland, um, two um, specialists from James Cook University in Australia, um, and uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists, got together to undertake what's called the Clim Climate Vulnerability Index uh, exercise at the um, Orkney World Heritage Site, which is the half community of Orkney. So this is um, investigating what exactly the climate change aspects are in this local circumstance. So that's bringing together climate scientists to research that. And then how it impacts on what's called the Outstanding Universal value of the World Heritage Site. So it's a bit, a bit kind of technical, a bit complicated. Uh, this uh, report is free, freely accessible online in Historic Environment Scotland's website. And there's shortly to be a similar exercise on the island of St Kilda um, and Historic Environment Scotland in partner calling for student note takers to sit at that event and help with taking notes. So if any of you are particularly interested, there's an opportunity in a few weeks time. Just give that a small plug. So, um, rushing quickly through the results of this, um, the climate scientists produced um, information which was shown in some resolution of what the uh, impacts of climate change are likely to be. Uh, as you can see, there's, there is that uncertainty that I was talking about um, increase in mean annual temperatures um, in winter and in summer and the change in precipitation, which is rainfall, um, which we can already see. So these are impacts that we're already seeing on the ground, as it were. And here seeing um, projected sea level rises, although I think it says they're seal level rises. <laughs> if it's wrong, that reports. So. Unless it's a typo that I put in there. Anyway, you can judge that for yourself when you look at the report. Um, you can see here that sea level is already rising and is set to rise um, to greater and lesser degrees, but still quite significantly, depending on um, what the temperature is, you know, depending on whether it's 1.5 or um, higher rises in temperature across the globe. Uh, so the findings of that exercise um, were that the the major impacts on the World Heritage Sites, and looking particularly at the Ring of Brodga and um, Scara Bray, which is the settlement, the Neolithic settlement um, on the shore, and the major impacts we, we decided facing these sites for sea level change, precipitation change, and storm intensity and frequency. So of the, of the list on, from the Historic Environment Scotland um, report, these were the ones that we found um, would impact the sites, and indeed that their impacts were high, likely to be. So this is the highest level of impact, obviously, where we do more high. So that's um, quite a worrying um, outcome from from this um, from this report and from from this work we did. And indeed, we've done um, more recently two um, different World Heritage sites in one in Tanzania and one in Nigeria, and those um, were not. It's quite, quite complex, but those were found to be not quite so high. But then again, the resilience of those places um, in different ways to cope with the changes um, were not so great. So um, the, the sort of social and economic aspects of these changes were taken into account as well in this kind of study that's being undertaken. And there you can see the Ring of Bronca. Um, if you've been there already or when you go there, you'll find that you can't actually walk around inside the ring anymore. 
which was always possible until um, well, about three years ago. Um, and you can see that the, the wetness um, through increased rainfall, but this is compounded by the huge increase in tourism and therefore footfall, which has happened over the same period of time, really, in the last five to ten years, there's been a great increase in tourism. That's what we call a compounding picture. And you can see below, um, in the picture below, the efforts that have been undergone to improve the drainage and to improve the resilience of the footpath, um, which were found not to be enough to take uh, the, the different circumstances of the increased footfall and the increased rainfall. So you have to walk around the outside of the ring now because of those management issues. Um, different, different things happening at, at Star of Bray. Here, here in the picture, you can see um, the very soft sand links that the site is built into, upon and into, um, and how that's um, eroding through the course of the Atlantic, because it's on the west coast. Um, and uh, in the distance in this picture, you can see the different types of sea defences, and they have to be replaced every few years as the, the sea eats in around, around the site and erodes it. And then the captions there, the climate change in Orkney will translate into a wide range of compounding impacts. Um, in many cases, they will interact with and exacerbate other pressures. And there it says the growing tourism numbers, the infrastructure development and agricultural practices too. So all these things are interwoven, as I'm, as I'm sure you all you know, you can see in the world around you, you can't really, it's hard to separate these different aspects. You know, climate change is part of um, a, whole, a whole web of things creates these circumstances and these circumstances such as increased tourism then feed into the problem as well. Um, so this, this what, what's happening in Orkney, particularly with sea level rise, um, causes great amount of coastal erosion. And this is something that's been called attention to for 30 years now by Julie Gibson, who's the outgoing county archaeologist and her predecessor, Raymond Lamb, um, who for a long time have been observing and charting the loss of archaeological sites into the sea in Orkney. There's a particular problem in Orkney and the Western Isles because of the um, sheer amount of coastline you get on island groups and because of the fact that some of these coastlines are very soft, they're linked sites and um, sandy sites. Um, and the archaeology is very, very well preserved um, on the whole, and then it's very rich, very dense in the amount of archaeological sites in Orkney, particularly in the Western Isles. So when you get the, the coast eroding, you're losing a lot of archaeological sites. And now, as I say, uh, Historic Environment Scotland then created the body for Scape, who've been working um, partly um, on coastal survey and also engaging the community in um, quantifying the problem by going around recording sites on the coast to try and see if we can see exactly how many sites are being lost and how they could be prioritised. But with so many hundreds of sites, it's really difficult, obviously, to resource any concerted effort at um, preservation, whether that be preservation in situ or preservation by record, which is what we call the process of um, investigating, say, through excavation. So Environment Scotland commissioned um, the body called Ease to do an assessment of the sites in Orkney. And just from a third um, of the coast that was surveyed, this is the, the quantity of sites that they discovered. And you can see through the, the darker sort of magenta bars, um, those are the threatened sites. So in each case, the number of sites is closely shadowed by the number of threatened sites. So this reflects how many sites are coastal and how many sites are under threat. This work, as you can see, was done uh, 20 years ago now, so um, obviously lots of sites will have been lost since then. Just to take one example, so this is um, a site called Hodgley on the island of Westbury, one of the bigger North Isles of Orkney, um, an Iron Age rock site, um, and this is a, a sort of typical site of um, coastal erosion, coastal, uh, archaeological coastal erosion. It's not a very pretty site, um, but there's lots of really, really interesting evidence here. 
Um, it's a rock site with an adjacent village, which has never been investigated archaeologically. You can see there all the stonework and what we call midden or um, rubbish deposits um, around the site as well. The big heap, the big green hill to the left of the picture is the broth, and then the lower areas are the, the village that surrounds it. So this was a picture that was taken, as it says, in 1990, when it looks like there were what are called wheelhouses possibly surrounding the broth, which is very rare in Orkney. Um, but as I say, it's never been um, investigated, so we, we don't know for sure. A door lintel, which um, somebody from Westfield called being able to go in and out of these um, houses um, in, from his childhood. And then the progress of the erosion charted until two, 2006, when you can see the, the fence that was there in uh, 1990 was then replaced by a fence further inland. And then this is that fence um, pretty much falling in the sea itself. So this is some meters of the coast has gone back. And this is the very end of some of those houses where if we were looking at the front doors, this is the walls of those buildings disappearing. And that was then, um, and now it's an area and there will be a lot more erosion there. So there's been a program of work on the island of Ramsey to look at this um, these impacts and also to look at the these um the minutiae of the cost, uh, progress of the erosion and how, how it takes place and what exactly happens um by looking again at, at rocks or iron age sites so we have the site of um south how here with the scaffolding where we're looking at the eroding section um and getting some dateable material and trying to find out more about the rock uh, before it disappears completely. And then Swandro, which is an ongoing piece of work, which you'll be able to visit again next summer, um, and was open for eight weeks this summer, where a really big Iron Age building, which you can see the curved wall of in the foreground, is being pounded by the sea every winter. So um, you wouldn't believe the size of the rocks that are cast up onto this site in the winter. It doesn't look a very rough part of the coastline. Um, and there, um, Steve Dockle and Julie Bond and their team are looking at that kind of process of where the stonework can still survive, but sea has sucked out all the sediments and then pushed in things like um, microplastics and uh, debris from the sea to replace the sediments. So if you like, the integrity of the site is being lost while well, you can still see some structure, but um, the deposits are actually being removed year on year. Um, the broth just beside that, the one that had the scaffolding on is um, called Midhow. There were three of them in close proximity on Rousey. And this one was um, excavated and then taken into guardianship or state care and has a really nice um, seed event defense put around it. In the times when um, the government used to put quite a lot of money into certain sites, you know, they were done, had them excavated and then presented to the public and create, um, in this case, a seed events to preserve the site. So this is um, a method of um, building the stone called casting, which is where the, the, the sandstone is placed on edge, as you can see, you've got a very distinctive look to it. But this particular type of build um, is actually mimicking what people in the Iron Age did on the rock above. So you can see some of that casting in the picture. Kind of above the, it's, it's stones leaning upright on edge and they are helping to buttress the rock. The, the rock. Um, so they're, they're using that same technique in the more modern times and it's been very successful and it, it stood the test of time. And there's just a little bit of erosion up right at the bottom of that, which has been um, then infilled with concrete. But all in all, this has been a very successful way of keeping that site defended by using more I guess, ancient te techniques. Um, the site of Scara Bray is very problematic because, as I said, it's um, in um, soft uh, macro links um, and so is eroding at the pace. And you can see the position of the bay there um, and the shape of it. Um, and Scara Bray sits out here, right there. So um, it gets a lot of storm storm damage um, through through the winter and other times of the year. 
um, and the, the village itself sits right on the edge of that coast. So, sort of, in terms of um, the responses to this this damage and the, you know the prospects of such a loss of great amounts of archaeological site, there's a kind of we have a, a suite of things that we can do. I mean, one is the physical defences, um, building physical defences, and then putting those. Um, rebuilding them and maintaining them. Another is um, collecting a lot of more data about the site through various means, and then finding out, therefore, its context and what the um, what the the loss, you know, the, the entirety of the site is better understood by things like geophysical survey, so you can know how the loss in on the site as a whole. Um, and in the case of Star of Grey. We um, undertook geophysical survey magnetometry right across the area, and the blue areas and the purple are the archaeological deposits. So you have Scara Bray and it extends inland, so you can see there's more to the site here. So that's a bit of a hurrah. So there's um, more to investigate if the site that we see is lost, although that's not great. Um, and then Behind here, we've understood now more about the Iron Age sites as well, the Bronze Age houses that we can see in the blue and the purple splodges. Um, you can look at this in greater detail in the volume that we published on it called Landscapes with Neil. And then another project which has been ongoing called Dynamic Coast, which is a Scotland wide project which takes this, this same bay as a case study, looking at the regression of the coast. And uh, using the data that's collected, I think every year or maybe every other year, um, in Scar Gray, particularly to see how fast the loss is and therefore trying to predict what the damage will be. Um, other types of responses are to undertake rescue excavation, as we saw at South Cow and here at Catasan, where sites are being destroyed very quickly. Um, and here at this site, we um, myself, Colin Richards, Chris G, and Vicky Cummings from UCLAN, um, got small amounts of money and conducted uh, rescue excavations over the few years before COVID, before the pandemic, um, because this site's kind of almost intertidal, really, and is disappearing very fast. And this has been um, quite a quick, quick way of gathering as much data as you can before the site disappears completely. And in this case, this, the findings were an early Neolithic house, which was unexpected, and also this huge deposit of 19th century pilot whales, um, which were killed, driven ashore, and then killed, and then left in heaps, and then put into pits that cut into the Neolithic house. So in terms of the kinds of archaeology, they're both very um, almost emotive or evocative, um, both in the situation of them being eroded at the moment, and what they say about the way people lived in the past and the way um, they re interact with different resources, I guess, and um, other living species like the whales in this case. So this um, excavation of this site then created quite a lot of um, press interest. And it was quite interesting for us to see that the, the interest was in, in part about, about the whales and um, you know, the plight of them. And in part about what it tells us about early prehistory. So we had a series of people coming to interview um, from the BBC and various bodies. Uh, and all in all, it was sort of promoting this idea of that climate change is impacting and the sort of different impacts that people have had on the environment through time. So it was a great way to interact with the public at large and talk about climate change. Um, and sort of try and raise it a bit on the agenda through what we were finding at this site. Um, and different ways of looking at um, the impacts of uh, coastal erosion and climate change at the site of Pool, again on Sandy, which had been excavated um, by a team from Bradford, again including Steve Dockle and Julie Bond in, in the um, 1980s. Uh, we revisited this site um, more recently and did a, a different kind of um, investigation there where we, we looked at um, how you can do different kinds of recordings or use traditional archaeological techniques in different ways to create a different record. So this was getting together a group of artists, um, anthropologists, all sorts of different disciplines and the public um, 
whoever wants to come along from the island of Sandy. So we had a really wide age range as well. Um, looking at how we use the scanner to create different kinds of images, and this is Dan Lee and Rebecca Mardin in photography, and um, Mark Jenkins created a film which you can you can still access, and then the students from art created sculptures which um, were displayed in the Clear Art Centre. Um, that was a different way, I guess, of creating that conversation and engaging new audiences in looking at. Um, the issue of plastics, of course, but also climate change, environmental change, and um, coastal erosion, and the site that sits at that, the, the sort of centre of those discussions, um, and the archaeology concepts sort of in different ways. Um, and these kinds of activities um, called attention to um, the coastal erosion and its sea level rises, and the New York Times did a a feature on, on this and its impact in Orkney, which again then excited a lot of attention, attention internationally, and people um, came from all around the world saying, well, What can we do to help? So, you know, this is terrible, this is happening. But again, I say, you know, it's more important that it raises the profile of what's happening in terms of climate change as much as what we can do um, to preserve the archaeology. Um, and so, similarly, um, research that um, myself and Colin Richards and um, Sue Hamilton from UCL and um, the group of uh, other, lots of other people in the team, uh, including Kate Wellen too, is one of the leaders of the project. We've been working in uh, Easter Island or Rapa Nui um, doing different work to look at various aspects of the archaeology. And as part of that, I was looking at the impacts of climate change and sea level rise, particularly, and increased storminess on the monuments in, in Easter Island. Um, and that, again, uh, became part of, um, well, one of the, the, uh, the series of articles the New York Times did on the impacts of climate change on um, heritage around the world. And so the impacts in, in um, Rapa Nui are quite um, visible at the moment. And they're really quite um, quite worrying because most of the sites that are the Ahus, which are the platforms with the statues on them, or lying down near them, um, are built around the, the coast of the island. The island's very small, it's not surrounded by a reef, so the, um, the, the storms can batter it without the protection of a reef. Um, and so you're seeing some of that in these pictures here, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about that now. So the platforms, some of them have the, the Moai placed upon them, others have them, um, they never have statues or they have them still lying down. So for, on the, the economy of Rapa Nui is very much based on tourism, as you will um, anticipate, and these sites are, of course, particularly important because they're the iconic sites. Um, the sites that have the statues standing upon them have been reconstructed because the statues were all down. Um, and these are all um, in the places where they are vulnerable to flooding and inundation and therefore the impacts of increased storms and you know, level rise. And here you can see on the map those little black statues are all the, the Arku with the statues all the way upon them. And you can see the position of them all around the coast. And those um, sites are still sacred today. Um, they're the sites of also a lot of human remains. Um, there's cremated bone. Uh, there are um, some burials too, which are focused within and uh, um, around the, the Arkham. So um, it's this kind of evidence that is being lost as well without being recorded or being able to be researched because it's being lost at such a rate. And of course, it's the expense of um, of looking at these sites and the fact that they are still sacred too, so um, you know they're still they're still useful, utilized by the Rapa Nui. Um, so this is um, the sort of aspects of what um, we wanted to look at in terms of bringing together heritage, climate science, and communication in. Uh, a work that we did together with, um, as part of ICOMOS, a working group on climate change. And that then played out in um, 
looking at this project called Heritage on Ed on the Edge, which is part which is funded by Google Arts and Culture. So this is again something a resource that you can look at online. One of the sites that was looked at um, was um, Rapa Nui, looking at the impacts of um, climate change and how that affects the economy, how it affects um, people, and it involved a series of interviews with people. Um, looking at what the heritage means to them, how they value it, and what the impacts of climate change will therefore what impact they will have on the people of Afanui. And as I say, this this um, resource is, a, is available and this is a, a clip a clip from that um, resource. So this involved uh, me going out with the, the team of um, the group from SIARC who um, undertake 3D recording and they work with the people on Rapa Nui, the teams there who have the same equipment. So part of the answer to the loss of this um, heritage is to create 3D models. So this is capture of data at very high resolution so that um, if you like the, if the sites are lost, then you still have this digital representation in a very great detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so that particular site is being both undercut and then the sites are in danger too of overtopping, which is storm surges, and then also, of course, prone to tsunami, which have in the past affected um, the site, say here, this um, Ark and Tonga region. And not only is it the statues, but the canoe, the canoe ramps, which can disappear, which are very rare. Um, and then calling attention to this again was a whole series of um, interviews and interest around the world. And then the government, the Chilean government, put resources into looking at how the problem of a loss of heritage could be addressed. That included um, working with the communities to look at this particular site, which is particularly important to them, and which has now um, meant that a new sea defence has been created which is this um, sort of buff uh, creation here. So there were two, two different levels of defense created for that particular site. So that working with the community to prioritize which site to put the resources into to create an actual physical defense. Um, and so as part of that work over the years, we've been um, working in heritage education, uh, linking with the Rapa Nui and the work they're doing with the children there and linking that to children in Orkney so that they could each share their experiences and learn more about each other's heritage and therefore um, the issues surrounding heritage and um, part of that being the impact of climate change. So it's part of the way of um, getting climate literacy and heritage education brought together. So just to sum up, I think that um, obviously these problems are really big, they're insurmountable. Um, it means that uh, things have to be prioritized, um, largely I would say on the basis of how people value. Um, so that's going to be something that's very important. And here, I'll just end with um, this quote from one of the Rapa Nui who was um, interviewed and what she has to say about what the heritage of Rapa Nui means to her. Thank you so much, Jane, for that. And sorry about the delay at the start. It means we've now run out of time for questions if we are going to Ingrid's talk at Preble Grammar School. Um, so I think we'll just leave it there. A huge thank you to you, Jane, for such a very, very important talk. Thank you. That's okay. Thanks, everybody. And you can... Um... Contact me or come up to me um, and if you want to discuss further or ask any questions. Thanks. Okay.